Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to do an overview of the pharmacology of Parkinson's disease. But before we get into all that, let's do a brief review of the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease really involves destruction of neurons that belong to a cluster called the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra are neurons that generate a lot of dopamine. And by generating dopamine, they help to modulate the function of the basal nuclei. Most people refer to it as basal ganglia, which is involved in control of voluntary movements. And so without the substantia nigra, because they're dying, you have less dopamine release and less dopamine to control the basal nuclei. And so over time, you end up with the four cardinal signs of Parkinson's disease, which would be a resting tremor. You have rigidity akinesia or bradykinesia, and postural instability. Of course, there's other things associated with Parkinson's disease, but those are the four cardinal signs. So without these neurons here of the substantia nigra, there's less dopamine. Now, in general, these cells have a normal way that they would synthesize dopamine, assuming they're healthy. So right here, we just have a capillary in red. And right here in gray, this is our blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier really prevents most things from crossing from the blood into the brain. Uh, but it does allow large molecules, they have an easier time, especially if they're lipid-soluble or hydrophobic, or if they're specific molecules that obviously have to get to the brain, so natural molecules that it normally needs, like this amino acid tryptophan. So normally tryptophan would just be traveling in the blood. It can cross the blood-brain barrier through transport proteins, okay? And then the tryptophan can then be taken up by these cells of the substantia nigra, or really any cell for that matter. And once in there, there's a couple of enzymatic reactions. Those are, in order, tyrosine hydroxylase, and then the second one is aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, which in this context most people just call dopa decarboxylase, and that converts the intermediate into dopamine. And then the substantia nigra will actually use that dopamine to control the basal nuclei. Now in Parkinson's disease, there's less of these neurons, so there's less of this metabolic pathway to convert tryptophan to dopamine, and therefore less dopamine. And so to combat this, the drug of choice is actually levodopa. Um, in a biochemistry context, it's called L-dopa, but these are the same thing. And so let's see what happens with levodopa. So there's two things that L-dopa can do. One, L-dopa can go through the blood here and cross the blood-brain barrier through transport proteins. And then that L-dopa will be taken up by the remaining cells of the substantia nigra. And the second enzyme, dopa decarboxylase, will convert it to dopamine. Okay. And so theoretically, if we have more L-dopa that's taken up by the remaining cells, there's going to be more dopamine, even though there's less of the cells. We just overload this enzyme with its substrate, and we get more of a product, dopamine. The other thing that we have to worry about with L-dopa is that before this molecule actually gets to the capillaries leading to the brain, it can be metabolized in the periphery. So in the periphery, there are other dopa decarboxylase enzymes that can prematurely convert L-dopa to dopamine. So why is that a problem? Because only L-dopa can cross the blood-brain barrier. Dopamine cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So that's why we can't just give these people oral dopamine, even though they're deficient in dopamine. We can give them all the dopamine in the world, but it's never going to get to these cells, and they're never going to be able to use it. So we have to give the precursor to it, which can cross the blood-brain barrier, and then that precursor, which is L-dopa, can then be taken up and converted to dopamine. Now, there's a problem with this type of treatment alone. It's that there's a lot of this peripheral metabolism to dopamine prematurely, and so not a whole lot of L-dopa will get to the brain and to these substantia nigra cells. Some will, but we want a little bit more to be able to get there. So what we typically do is we use a combo treatment of carbidopa and levodopa. These two drugs are given in one formulation called Cinemet. That's the trade name, which is both carbidopa and levodopa. Now, carbidopa can also not cross the blood-brain barrier, but carbidopa has another function. It's an inhibitor of dopa decarboxylase. Now, what did this enzyme normally do? It metabolizes L-dopa prematurely into dopamine, and then the dopamine is unable to cross the blood-brain barrier. 
So by inhibiting this enzyme, you actually allow more L-DOPA to get into the blood, into these capillaries that lead to the blood-brain barrier, and so then there's more L-DOPA available to those substantia nigra cells. So the administration of this as the formulation with carbidopa, the carbidopa inhibits dopa deep carboxylase and spares the L-DOPA from peripheral metabolism, so that way there's more of it to be used by the substantia nigra cells. Another thing, this carbidopa can't cross the blood-brain barrier, so it can't come over here and inhibit this aromatic amino acid decarboxylase in the substantia nigra. So it works out pretty well that way. Another reason that we'd want to also use the carbidopa with the levodopa is that uh, L-DOPA causes some peripheral signs and symptoms that aren't so good. So nausea, vomiting, there can be cardiovascular symptoms, there can be psychological symptoms. And so theoretically, if there's less L-DOPA in the periphery, then there's going to be less of those symptoms. And so by inhibiting dopa decarboxylase, you allow more of that L-DOPA to get to the brain, and so there's less of that L-DOPA left in the periphery, and so less of those symptoms at the heart or at the GI, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Now, any dopamine that's made by these substantia nigra cells is packaged into vesicles, and it's sent along the course of the axon all the way down here. We follow this path, and then down here to the axon terminals of these neurons of the substantia nigra. Now, at this point, hopefully we understand the events that are occurring at the synapse, but again, under an electrical stimulation, dopamine will be released from a vesicle into the synapse by exocytosis, Here's our dopamine. It travels across the synapse and binds to its corresponding dopamine receptor on the postsynaptic cell membrane. And this cell is a neuron uh, belonging to the basal nuclei. So sorry I misspelled that right there, but it's really going to be neurons of the putamen, the caudate nucleus, or in some cases the globus pallidus, which I don't have labeled there. Now there's a few other things here that we can also affect to treat Parkinson's disease, but to understand that, we have to understand the metabolism here. So dopamine is going to bind to this receptor, but dopamine shouldn't stay here in the synapse indefinitely. Just like any neurotransmitter, it has to have a way to be degraded. And there's two major enzymes here that can degrade dopamine. One of them is called catechol-O-methyltransferase. So this enzyme basically methylates dopamine and inactivates it, or makes it less active. And so catechol-O-methyltransferase leads to the production of less active methylated metabolites. Another enzyme here is what's called monoamine oxidase, uh, sometimes called MAO. And specifically, monoamine oxidase B is going to metabolize dopamine into less active oxidized metabolites. Whether or not you know they're oxidized or methylated is probably not relevant for you. What is important, though, is to understand that these two enzymes inactivate dopamine. They make it less active so that dopamine can't exert its effects on the basal nuclei. Well, if our whole problem is that we have less dopamine, wouldn't it make sense to also inhibit these two enzymes? Because if we inhibit these two enzymes, they're not going to be able to inactivate dopamine, and so there's going to be more dopamine remaining in the synapse that can exert its effects for a longer period of time. That's the theory here. So let's first look at inhibitors of catechol o methyltransferase So these are drugs that are often used as a second line of defense in conjunction with levodopa, carbidopa therapy. So our levodopa and carbidopa, that's our treatment of choice generally, our first line of defense. But sometimes when those drugs start to become a little bit less active due to tolerance, we can throw in an inhibitor of catechol o methyltransferase And those two drugs are in tacopone, and tolcopone. Now tolcopone is not usually used as much because it has liver toxicity associated with it, so the one of choice usually is going to be entacopone. And entacopone is an inhibitor of catechol o methyltransferase And so by inhibiting this enzyme, you inhibit some of the inactivation of dopamine, and so dopamine therefore is able to stay in the snaps longer and exert its effects longer. Now we also have monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and the major one here is selagiline. So selagiline is an inhibitor specifically of monoamine oxidase B, and so it inhibits this enzyme and again prevents the inactivation of dopamine. So you have more dopamine available for a longer period of time in the synapse where it can then exert its effects. Now some sources will say that these monoamine oxidase inhibitors can be used as a first line of defense to delay the need for L-DOPA, 
like it says here. However, monoamine oxidase inhibitors are not actually used as much anymore. They've been replaced by other drugs. And the main reason for that is monoamine oxidase inhibitors have a lot of side effects. The side effects are mainly related to this molecule called tyramine. We won't get into this too much, but I do have another video where I talk about this in my channel. The basic idea is that these enzymes actually inhibit the degradation of tyramine as well. This is another biogenic amine similar to dopamine. And tyramine has effects all over the body, including at the heart and the GI tract. And when you inhibit the degradation of tyramine, because you're inhibiting this enzyme, tyramine levels skyrocket, and this can cause a hypertensive crisis. That's only one of the side effects. There's, of course, many others, but this is probably the main thing to watch out for, okay? And that means you have to avoid foods that have tyramine, so that includes pickled, fermented foods, includes beer and wine, since those are both fermented. They have lots of tyramine in them. And so if one is on an MAO inhibitor, they have to be very careful uh, to avoid those foods as to prevent these very bad side effects from occurring. Now these two classes of drugs right here, they both inhibit enzymes that would normally degrade dopamine. And so by inhibiting them, they allow dopamine to be active and act in the synapse longer to exert its effects, which is beneficial for Parkinson's disease, since normally there's less dopamine. There's another way that we can also stimulate dopamine function, and that's by actually stimulating the dopamine receptor on the postsynaptic cell, which belongs to the basal nuclei. So these are gonna be dopamine receptor agonists. Now in general, they're gonna stimulate dopamine receptors even in the absence of dopamine. And so in some cases, uh, they can be used as a first line of defense also to delay the need for L-DOPA. However, they're generally going to be used much later in the disease process um, when there's advanced disease and other issues like dyskinesias or akinetic episodes. So let's take a look at those. So the first one we'll look at is actually amantadine. So amantadine is a dopamine receptor agonist. This one has particular usefulness um, in treating the L-DOPA-induced dyskinesias. Okay. It also functions as a glutamate receptor antagonist. So one thing that's important to know is that excessive glutamate can cause uh, excitotoxicity, which leads to death of neurons. Okay. So if you're already in a state like Parkinson's where your neurons are dying, sometimes it might make sense to actually inhibit the glutamate receptor, okay, since activation of that receptor can cause more excitotoxicity. Amantadine also functions as a glutamate receptor antagonist. So one thing that's important to know is that some glutamate receptors, like the NMDA receptor, uh, these can actually, when excessively activated, lead to excitotoxicity and cause death of neurons. Well, this person has Parkinson's. They're already suffering from the loss of neurons. So it would make sense to actually try to decrease more death of those neurons through decreasing the excitotoxicity. And so by antagonizing or blocking that glutamate receptor, that could potentially help with that. However, the main function of amantanine is really treating those induced kinesias through levodopa therapy. The other drug here, which is also a dopamine receptor agonist, is apomorphine. The second P shouldn't be there. Apomorphine, also called apokine. This is used in the advanced stages of Parkinson's disease really to treat akinetic episodes. Okay, so this would actually not be a first line of defense in any case. It's only used in the very late stage of, stages of the disease when a patient has an akinetic episode. There's also some drugs over here that you might see used in Parkinson's disease that are functioning as dopamine receptor agonists. The first one is bromocryptine. Then we have primapexyl and ropinirole. These three are indicated for both Parkinson's disease and restless leg syndrome, or RLS. The fourth one here is a dopamine receptor agonist, but it's not indicated for Parkinson's disease, and that's uh, cabergolin, and that's only indicated for restless leg syndrome. So hopefully this video gave you a good overview of the pharmacology of Parkinson's disease, and hopefully you understand why each drug is used in a particular area to affect the amount of dopamine or dopamine action. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.